Hey everyone, it is time for another recitation. Uh, today we are going to be taking a look at the WebAuth 1 um, content, and today is going to be focusing on authentication. When we say auth, we, we generally have two things that we're referring to simultaneously, and that's authentication and authorization. Authentication is proving who you are, right? That's, that's registration and login. That's establishing who you are as a person and then proving it. It's, you know, providing your ID, giving your credentials, logging in. That's authentication. Being able to go from being logged in and being able to access various parts of the application without having to constantly prove who you are, that's authorization. Right? That is the, the stamp on the back of your hand, that is the, the wristband, that is the, the security badge. Right? That's authorization. Once you have been authenticated, then you are cleared to be authorized. Today, we're just going to be looking at authentication, and we'll also set up a basic uh, authorization scheme um, that you should never, ever, never use. But... Um, it will help build uh, what we want to do tomorrow with authorization using cookies. So today, uh, we're going to be just building from scratch our Node Express app in order to handle user registration and login. So uh, I'm starting from essentially a bare repository here. I've got a readme. I've already set up a package.json, um, and I'm going to add our dependencies. So I'm going to do yarn add express next SQLite 3 and bcrypt.js, which is going to be the new dependency that we're using here in order to uh, encrypt or hash the user's passwords because don't store passwords in plain text. That's the number one bad thing you can do. All right, so there we go. Um, we've got our dependencies installed, and let's go ahead and start up our project. Um, I am going to first configure my database because that's where that's where I like to start. Um, so I'm going to create my next file and I'm not going to use uh, next in it. I'm just going to create this one by hand because I think typing things like this out could be a really good exercise for trying to understand why um, why we are doing the things that we're doing. So uh, inside of the exports, I'm setting it equal to be an object and I'm going to have a key called development and that is going to contain the connection object for our development database. Under key client, I specify that I want to connect with SQLite 3. I'm also going to specify as use null as default so that we don't get those warnings about uh, columns that don't have a default value. Um, we're going to set our connection to just be a file name. I'm going to put this in dot slash data slash, uh, let's just do dev dot db3. Um, we want to enforce foreign keys generally by default. Um, we're not going to have any foreign keys in today's project, but it can't hurt to put this in here. In pool, we create a cre key called after create. This is going to take a function that accepts a connection object and then a done callback. And we are going to call connection.run and then the configuration option pragma foreign keys is equal to on. And when that's finished, it will call done for us. And after pool, uh, let's set up our migrations. Uh, let's give this a directory. Ooh, spelling of dot slash data slash migrations. And we'll do the same thing for seeds here, except we're gonna place my, replace migration with our seeds. All right, there we go. Got our database configured. Now let's go ahead and run npx next, migrate make bootstrap. There we go. Let's check out our migrations here. All right. So we want to create the schema for our users table. So we're going to return next.schema.create table in order to return that promise. Let's make a users table. Let's get that table into our callback function. Table.increments as usual. Um, we're also going to do table.string username.com. Um, 
unique dot mot nullable. It's pretty good stuff. And then table dot string password. This needs to be not nullable, but obviously not unique. Different users can have the same password. Then our bog standard is going to be next dot schema dot drop table if exists and that's going to be on users is there a schema here i believe there is yeah there is there is i was doubting myself for a second yeah there, there should because we're dropping tables not columns um yeah cool so that is our migration let's try and run it npx next migrate latest hey we got our migration working um i'm gonna save seeds for later um so that's good enough for me for now do we have any questions here with just setting up our database all right cool cool glad we're getting comfortable with this so i'm gonna come into data and I'm going to make our dbjs or dbconfigjs, whatever you want to call it. Just requiring our, uh, our next, requiring our next config out of our uh, next file. It's just up a level. And then I'm exporting calling next with our next config. And I'm just hard coding in this development key. Development. Yeah, that looks good. Requires spelled right. I goof that one up a lot. All right. So there's our database connection. Um, now let's go ahead and set up our server. So now I'm in the root of my project. We're going to do index.js. We're going to require express. We're going to set our server to be calling express. Server.use our express.json for good measure um, and then uh, I need a port number could someone please provide me with a port number Oop, this needs to be a callback function Tommy gives us 8000 all right We'll do that, and we'll see if I, I don't have anything running on that port. Um, okay, so now we've got our server up and running. Oop, I need to yarn add uh, dev uh, nodemon just to make our life a little bit easier. And then I'm going to go ahead and modify our package.json, and we're going to give it some scripts. server is going to be nodemon on index.js. There we go. So now let's do yarn run server. Hey, no crashes. Woo. There we go. Okay, so we have our users table. We have our server listening on, uh, on port 8000. Um, now it's time to set up first Let's do our registration endpoint, right? No point in writing login if we cannot register our users. So I'm going to create a... Uh, um, so this is where it we start to have to make decisions about how we want to organize our project because auth is going to require, right, to interact with the model we have for our users. Auth isn't really an umbrella endpoint in the same way that users represents a resource or books or whatever. Um, I'm going to choose to, for now, just um, put this inside a directory called auth because that's what I feel like doing. Um, and we're going to go ahead and create our um, users model in here. I could put this inside a directory called users. I don't know, man. I'm just doing this one how I feel like doing it right now. So we're going to require our DB um, from our data directory and then dbjs 
we're going to do module.exports equal to an object so we can export multiple things. And then we're also going to set up our endpoint. We're going to be writing our helper functions and our endpoint simultaneously. So I'm going to do auth router in here. We're going to require express. In order to set up our router, I'm going to one line it because I'm very cool and popular. All right, there we go. And module.exports our router. All right, and so let's set up our registration endpoint. So that's going to be our router.post. And I'm going to do this on slash register. And we're going to get our rec and our res. See? A lot of, we should be starting to feel comfortable kind of banging out the boilerplate here. Um, doing this a lot, doing this a lot. So what I want to do ultimately is I want to insert a user into my database. And if that is successful, they're going to receive a successful response. And if that's unsuccessful, well, then they'll receive an unsuccessful response. Um, so we're going to need to write a function here called insert. And this is going to take a user. Now, there's two ways we can handle this. We can handle the whole uh, hashing bit inside of our helper function if we want to, or we can handle that within our endpoint. Right? There's no requirement that we have to do this in either place. These are just functions that take in data and do things with them. We can choose to delineate their responsibilities any way we see fit. Um, I'm gonna stay consistent with the lecture here and handle the hashing inside of our endpoint but there is no reason why you could not do that inside of your helper function. So um, for this, we're just going to call dbusers.insert, and we're going to insert the user object. Um, I'm going to give as the second argument this returning here. Now, what this is going to do, and we'll see it happening, is, is this is going to print a warning to our console about SQLite not supporting IDs. I don't think anyone has ever formally delineated the difference between errors and, and warnings before for you all. So we can do things that aren't good, but they're also not show-stopping ending things. So that's what errors are. Errors mean you goofed up, you did something wrong, it broke. What a warning is, is basically a notification that you're doing something that you don't need or necessarily want to do. So when we insert a row in SQL, we can often specify a clause called returning. And we can say the columns that we want to be returned when the insert operation finishes. SQLite does not support returning. But uh, if you give it returning, nothing bad happens. It just ignores it because it's going to return the ID anyway. So next provides us with a warning about SQLite not supporting returning. That's not a error we have to fix. In fact, I want to see that because when we deploy to Heroku, Postgres requires returning in order for us to get that ID back. So we'll receive the warning while using SQLite, but it will work correctly while using Postgres. So warnings are basically a notification. We do not always need to fix them. There are some warnings that are very helpful, like when we're making a React app and it warns us about importing stuff that we never use. Well, yeah, we can probably take those out. Um, but we don't have to. If we don't, if we don't remove those things, nothing bad is going to happen to our application. Okay, so now we've inserted. Going to do the standard thing: destructure my ID, and then um, for now, I'm just going to return this ID. I'll write the the get by ID function in just a minute. So um, in here, what I would normally do right, is I would destructure the uh, username and the password from the request body. And then we would call uh, user.insert, which I'm going to need to require our user. And I would call you know user.insert, and I would give it the object containing the username and the password. And then I would get the user, right, and I would uh, do res.status of 201 because we're creating a thing and then json back that user but 
we never, ever, never, never, ever, never, never want to store a user's password in plain text in our database. Instead, we're going to use a cryptographically secure hashing algorithm. And, and it's called Bcrypt. And basically what it does is we give it some input data and it will deterministically create what looks like random output data. But the idea here is it is deterministic. You give it the same input, you give it the same password, and it will always produce the same output. And you cannot go from output back to input. So this is cryptographically secure in the sense that if someone were to have access to our database, there is no way that they could rederive the user's passwords from the hashes um, unless they were to check by encoding passwords into the hash and seeing if that matched. So it doesn't lock away the user's passwords forever for no one to ever know because we technically need to know, right? When a user logs in, we want to be able to hash the password that they've submitted and check to see if it's the one we stored. So there is that avenue of attack left, but Bcrypt automatically implements a thing called a salt um, in order to prevent um, pre-calculating password hashes. So if, if we were to hash the password ABC123, right, we, we'd get some value with that, and it's deterministic, so it's always going to be the same thing. And then if we checked against a dump of some, some password database, we'd be able to identify very quickly everyone who had the password ABC123. The idea of a salt is it's basically some random noise we can stick on ABC123 in order to prevent pre-calculation of hashes. So now you would have to you know, calculate that with the salt, and that's part of what the number of rounds we choose when we use Bcrypt is doing, or is, is we're calculating the salt rounds um, against our password. And the salt is randomly generated by Bcrypt. We don't have to do it ourselves. Some other hashing algorithms would require us to provide a salt, but Bcrypt makes it up and it stores it along with the hash and the number of rounds so that when we compare a password against it, Bcrypt will automatically know the operations to do on the input password in order to get it to match our stored password. Whew, a lot of information there. Um, but basically, we do not want to insert the plain text password into our database. Instead, we want to use the Bcrypted hash of our password. So I'm going to require Bcrypt which I installed as the bcrypt.js dependency. And then we are going to use bcrypt.hashsync. And that is going to hash our password. Um, and it's going to do so synchronously. Um, if we just tell it to hash, then um, it will do so uh, asynchronously. And we can either provide it a function to call when it's done, right, our callback. But in, in modern JavaScript implementations, it will also act as a promise if we wanted to do it that way. Um, we're going to be using fairly low values for the, um, the salt rounds. So we can do this synchronously just fine. If we wanted it to take like three seconds to, to hash the password, write a ton of salt rounds, then maybe we want to make it asynchronous. Um, and we can see all the... Um, documentation for this here just on the on the package and the github page um, so i'm going to give it the plain text password um, and then i also want to provide it with um, the number of salt rounds right we can also generate our our salt manually here if we don't bcrypt is going to do that for us um, and i'm just going to go with eight because that'll complete fast enough. Um, you could also use an environment variable to decide how many salt rounds you want to use based on whether you're in development or production. Oh, neat idea. Um, you can do that pretty much anywhere. So um, now we're going to be encrypting that password before we store it in our database. And um, let's add our dot catch on here. All right, I'm still seeing people, I'm still seeing people uh, come to me and say, ah, oh, I'm getting a 500 and I don't know why, and they haven't console logged their error. And it makes me so very, so very sad, right? Because the idea behind a catch block is we're saying, all right, if we get an error, um, uh, I want to handle it. 
I want to decide to handle that error because the default response to an error is to just throw it to the console and crash our program. Um, but when you, when you do a catch, you're saying, I'm expecting this error and I want to handle it appropriately. And if you don't know why you're getting the error, well, then you really can't handle it appropriately. So console log it, right? Or just remove your catch block. If you don't know why, it'll, it'll throw to the console. If, if you're asking for help and saying, I don't know why I'm getting this error and you cannot say what the error is, then that's a bad, it's a bad way to ask for help. Um, okay, so we've got this going. We've got our error console logged. Um, we're gonna need to, I, you know, want to. In this case, actually, we don't need to return the user object. Um, we don't need to. We're we're just fine with giving back the ID, and that's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm going to give a message here of user registered, and then I'm going to give them the ID, because why not? That seems like a perfectly fine thing to do. Um, we're going to need to hook this up to our um, uh, index.js. So let's pop over there. Let's uh, require, I'll do it in the middle here, our auth router. Auth router. It's going to be inside of our auth folder, and then the auth router JS, and then we'll add that to our server. Server.use slash auth auth router. Okay. So finally, we come over to our insomnia, and we're going to register a user. So I'm going to make a post request against localhost. 8000 slash auth slash register and we're going to give this uh, json body when we're registering this is part of the body right we're making a post request so it's going to be in the body and the username is going to be henry and the password is going to be test that seems good to me so now Let's see what happens. Boom, 500 server error. What did I do wrong? User.insert is not a function. Oh no, I did the thing. I did the thing, everyone. I forgot to export it. Okay. Oh, cannot read property then of undefined. Which then does it not like? I think you're not returning the database call out of the info function. Oh. Thank you, Amir. There we go. Now we got an error registering the user. And this is telling me, right, I could be sitting here confused for a very long time if all I received is this message. But this has been console logged. And it's saying unique constraint failed users dot username is is failing its unique constraint. And that's because in my previous request, while it appeared unsuccessful to me, the requester, because it didn't uh, throw me a 500, um, it actually worked behind the scenes. Our, our JavaScript just failed. So we did successfully insert the user Henry. And we can change this. And we can insert the user Blevins. And we'll see that it now works. So... There we go. There's our uh, there's our registration. So, do we have any questions about this? All right. Cool. Um, so then, let's go ahead and handle logging in. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to set up another router that is going to do a post. And I'm going to copy and paste this because they're going to be pretty similar overall. So let's have login. Um, we're going to be getting username and password again out of the body. When we log in, that's a post request where we're sending data to an endpoint and the data directly relates to what we want to happen on that endpoint. Right? That's when we're going to use our request body on the post. Um, but in, instead of 
inserting a user, we want to check for the user being inside the database and we want to compare their passwords. Now I can handle that entirely within my helper function if I would like to hide the implementation details from the endpoint. I'm going to stick with it in the endpoint just so it's consistent. Um, we're going to need another function though. And uh, we can handle this a couple ways. We can do this with a find by username function, which is going to take the username and is then going to return db of users where username and we want to get the first match there. Um, we're going to write functions like this a lot. So we could also write a slightly more general function, which is just going to be find by. And this accepts a where object. And then I'm going to do db of users where where. So we could use this find by by calling users dot. Uh, I guess I imported this as user, not users. Um, users dot find by and then I could do the whole username thing myself. Maybe I want to find it, you know, by ID or by something else. And, and now we have this very general function. The reason that I don't love um, uh, exporting this function for use within our um, endpoints is that um, if we want to find multiple things, that's great. This is a good function. It's good. But if we want to find the first one, then we would either need to change the dot first on here or perform destructuring within our endpoint. And I'm fine with the destructuring part. It's not my favorite, but I can live with it. Um, it's doing the dot first that I don't like. I do not like modifying the queries in any way, shape, or form inside of my endpoints. Now, this is just my opinion, um, but I feel like I should be masking the entirety of the implementation details of the dynamic query building we're doing with next by writing these helper functions. So I would prefer to, if I know I'm going to be doing find by username explicitly a lot, writing its own function. And you know what, we can even we can even take advantage of having this local find by function, um, right, and, and, and build off of that. Um, and only use the find by in cases where we're not looking for a singular thing or perform destructuring. I just, I just don't like the, the first on there. Um, but that's just my opinion. So I'm going to export for now our find by and our find by username. Not a big deal really though. Just a small stylistic choice here. And then I'm going to change this to be users just to prevent some eye twitching out there in the audience. Okay. So instead of doing user.insert, what I want to do is find by the username, right? Because when a user logs in, they're not giving you the ID of um, the user that, that they have. They're just giving you your username. Um, and so this is a case where hey, maybe we could use the username as a primary key. But um, what happens if the user wants to change their username, right? Um, you'll find on a lot of websites that's very much not allowed, and it can be very annoying. And there can be good reasons for it, but a lot of the reasons is because, well, that's the primary key. Or their database isn't normalized, so they would have to go and change it in a whole bunch of different places. Or it would break some backwards compatibility of people referencing your username and, and um, you know, buy the username instead of buy another primary key. Um, and so by just using another column for a primary key, we can avoid a lot of those, a lot of those pains. Um, not all of them, but, but a lot. Um, so uh, what we can do is if we know we're going to be searching by the username frequently, we can make the username an index, which is going to give us similar speed benefits to searching by the primary key. And I'm not going to explain how to do that because I'm leaving it as an exercise to the reader. Learn about indexes in SQL. Okay, so we're going to find our user. And then what I want to do is I want to get the user object. And now I need to compare the user versus the password that they had given us when they logged in um, and check and see if 
they are indeed who they claim to be. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to check and see if um, our user object exists because maybe we didn't find a user with that password. And if it does, what I want to do is I want to do bcrypt.comparesync. And what this is going to do is it is going to take a hashed password is the first argument and then an unhashed password is the second argument except the exact opposite of what I said, which is why I went and checked the documentation. Um, apparently it is plain text password first, and then the hash password. So it's always good to check the docs. Um, so again, there are synchronous and asynchronous versions of this function. Um, because we have our salt rounds pretty low, it's, it's fine to leave it as synchronous for the time being. Um, but you all know how to handle promises. Uh, I expect you can you can figure it out as well. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be comparing the password from our request body to the user.password, which is going to be the hashed version of the password from our database. And one, we, we need to check this user object for two reasons. One is because if we don't find that user, well, then obviously they can't be logged in, but we're trying to access a... Um, a property of user and if users undefined that's going to throw an error and I don't want that um, so um, if if the user exists if we are able to find a user by that username and we're successfully comparing the passwords so their password matches what we have stored then we want to send a successful response it's going to be a 200 we're not creating anything and uh, I'm just going to say Yay, you logged in. I never used exclamation points before come to Lambda. I don't know I don't know what y'all have done to me that makes me use exclamation points. I guess it's because I just feel so sad not using them on Slack sometimes where I'm like, thank you for submitting your air table. Period. No. Gotta give it a little bit of cheer. Um, so in the case that the user doesn't exist or uh, their password doesn't match, we want to just uniformly send them a, um, a, a failing status code. We don't want to identify that the user doesn't exist, as Luis mentioned in lecture, and I'm getting a spam call, um, because uh, that's information that attackers shouldn't really know. And that can be annoying sometimes when you're trying to log into the website and you're trying both username and password combinations because you can't remember, but that's what the reset password thing is there for too. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna give we're gonna give back some negative status code and say uh, you know unauthorized or you know invalid password, even though um, you know. It might be the user not existing. Shh, we're being mean. Okay. So let's check and see if this is going to work. So I'm going to duplicate this. We're going to log in. We're going to hit our login endpoints. And we're going to send in Blevins and test and see what happens. Hey, 500 server error. Cannot read property first if undefined because apparently this is what I want to do today is not a not return my database calls. There we go. Yay, we logged in. And let's modify our password. Yay, it didn't work. Perfect. So, any questions with this part? I see Faye typing. Uh, does that also go for things like creating an account? I've seen lots of sites that have a that username is already taken message when signing up, but it makes sense to have that. But would that fall into the same issue as confirming there is no user? Um, yes uh, and no. Um, that can be a very helpful message when signing up because you're letting them know what they have to fix in order to be successful, which is not something we really want to give our attackers when trying to log in but is when, when we want our users to register. Um, another way around this is rate limiting. So I don't, like generally, if you've tried to jam in a bunch of username and password con uh, combos, it's eventually gonna lock you out of the system for some specified period of time. And so you can rate limit sign up pretty strictly because 
you know, most people are only going to try to sign up once, um, maybe twice if they get a bad username. Um, so that's fine. Um, ultimately, masking usernames isn't a huge deal. It can be a slight privacy concern if your, um, you know, application isn't something that people would want to publicly broadcast, you know, joining for whatever reason. Um, and, and you wouldn't want someone to be able to, like, type in their email and see, like, that email is already registered to, like, um, you know, like uh, some addiction anonymity place. Like, uh-oh. Uh, so that that's a choice that you'll have to make. But ultimately, uh, usually you can you can get away with telling them things during registration. It's also much easier to uh, to put uh, sign up stuff under some type of you know recaptcha uh, you know spam prevention detection system because it's much less annoying for normal users to do that once than having to do that on every login. So yeah, all right. So we've got our login and registration working, um, and that's honestly very good. It's very good. Um, we see when we when we try to post um, this user already existing, we're, we're getting the 500 here. Um, this is, you know, a case where I could, when I catch that error, inspect it to try to figure out if, if it is the specific username constraint that's giving me trouble and then give them back a more descriptive error, but I'm not going to do that here. Um, the last thing I want to do on the express side before trying to write a real quick React app, just so you all can't forget how to do that on me, is um, getting some type of authorization working. So let's fire up a, um, a user's um, endpoint, which in this case, I'm actually going to, to pop out users into another directory. Um, so I'm going to go into my terminal and uh, just do some file management real fast, because I don't really like doing file management inside of Emacs. So I'm going to make a directory called uh, users, and I'm going to move the user model from auth into users. And uh, I fixed my import here, so everything should be fine there. And now I'm going to pop into, uh, into users. And um, we're going to create users router, not JS. And we're going to require express, which I'm just going to copy some of this in here um, just to save me some time. All right. Generally, don't like copy and pasting because it's better to get the, the finger practice in there. But um, I've done it enough, so I don't have to. OK, so we're going to create a router.get for just our slash, rec and res. And we're going to perform users.get, which is going to require me to come in here and write our, uh, I'm just going to call it find this time. And we're going to return our DB of users. And I'm going to add it here. Look at me. Look at how much I've learned. Um, so we're just going to do users.find. Then we're going to get our users. And we are going to do res.status. I'm just going to do res.json because it should default to 200. We'll catch. We'll get our error. We'll console log our error. And res.status 500.json message error getting users. All right. So what we want to do is we want to restrict this endpoint to only users that have logged in. So um, we're going to perform a get request on localhost 5000 slash users. This is going to require us to pop into our index.js and uh, add our user stuff in here. So I'm going to place auth with users. And that should be good. Um, so couldn't get back to the server. Did I hit it in the middle of a restart? Or did I not set this up correctly? So that's server.use 
Oh, it's because I'm on 5,000, not 8,000. There we go. Yay, we get a uh, 5,000. Did I not save my user's model file? What? Users.find is not a function. I made it a function. Right here. Oh, it's because I'm in the old file. Oops. Oops. I didn't. I didn't do a good learning. Uh, so you know how I went and changed where users router was? I never went there in my editor. So we'll find this. We'll or users model. And we'll pop that in here. Okay, there we go. Hey, we get our stuff. And if you want to have a get endpoint on users, um, don't return the hash passwords. That's a bad thing <laughs> when that happens. Um, so you could, you know, limit the select or perform some filtration before that gets out. But uh, I'm fine. I'm fine showing that here just to verify that, yes, we do have hash passwords. Um, so... Uh, what I want to do is I want to restrict this. And the way I'm going to do this is with some middleware. So I'm going to grow and I'm going to create a directory called, uh, you know what, let's just do this inside of the auth. I could also create a directory called middleware. And uh, I'm going to create a file called uh, restrict.js. Um, and I am going to module.exports uh, function. And what this is going to do is this is going to inspect our Reckonar res. Uh, it's going to inspect uh, particularly the headers of our request, and it's going to determine from the headers if the user is allowed to access the endpoint that we're putting the restrict middleware on. So I'm going to get Reckon res. I'm going to define this function. And the idea is that we use the body of our request when we're sending data directly related to the, the functioning of that endpoint. And um, we use the headers to essentially contain options, configuration options, additional data not related to the specific functioning of this endpoint. Um, of course, you can do whatever you want, right? You are now a full stack dev capable of, of writing all, all parts of this system. So you could put everything in the headers if you wanted to, but don't do that. That's weird, <laughs> bad. Um, so when we learned how to do this with JSON web tokens, right, you would put the token under a header called authorization, and then the, uh, the server would grab that token out of there, do what was necessary with that to either reject or accept you. Here, we don't know how to make tokens yet. And today you all learned how to use cookies, which cookies are sent, you know, with the request, um, not as a part of anything we do within our JavaScript, um, so we're just going to write a very, very basic um, set of headers to determine if the user is, um, is authorized, which is just going to be a header called username and a header called password. And this is going to be a test. So you would never, never, ever, never want to do this again, right? Because the whole point of authentication is that it leads to authorization. Now, technically, this is a form of authorization, but it's a very bad, dumb one because uh, you're sending the password with every request. And this would also require you to store the password um, on the front end side in order to send it back with every request. So this is weird and bad, and I, I wouldn't recommend it. But so what we're doing today before, uh, you know, we learn how to handle uh, authorization correctly. So. In order to handle these, uh, we are very lucky because Express is nice to us. And just like we destructure things from rec.body, we can destructure things from rec.headers. So this is going to contain our username and our password. And we're going to check and see if this user exists. And we're going to you know, check and see if the password matches. Notice that I'm going to be writing the same code in two places from both our login endpoints and um, this one here. It's probably a good indication that I should write my own function, but 
I'm not going to this time because I shouldn't really be <laughs> writing that code anywhere else. That's a login thing. This isn't how I should be handling this. So I'm just going to pop back into our auth router. And um, I am going to jack this code. And the idea here is that um, I want to find the user by their username. And then if they exist, I want to check their password. This is going to require me requiring bcrypt, bcrypt.js. Um, but in the case that this is successful, then I want to go to the next piece of middleware. Right? I don't want to send a response. I just want to let you know whatever endpoint happen. But um, in the case that it isn't good, I'm going to send back a 403 and say not authorized. All right, this is our authorization. You're not allowed to access this here. And um, we want an error on here, which we never changed in the logging. Um, error verifying user. Um, and so, oh, we're also going to need to require our users model. So that's going to be dot dot slash users users model. So what this uh, middleware is going to do is it's going to check for the user information and the headers, verify that that user is correct. Um, if it is, it's going to pass us off to the next piece of middleware, which is going to be our endpoint. And if it isn't, we send back an error. And the endpoint never needs to know that this request came in for it because we're specifically disallowing that from happening. To apply this middleware, I'm going to pop into my user's router. Um, I'm going to require this piece of middleware, which I'm calling restrict. And we have to pop out and into auth and get restrict.js. And then we can just apply it by spelling require correctly. And then adding it to our list of middleware on this endpoint. So. Let's check this out and see if this works. All right, so it worked, but we should always try to break it. There we go, not authorized. Perfect. So any questions about this basic, very, very bad authorization middleware? Yeah, Henry. Um, so if we wanted to use this middleware on different endpoints, um, is there a way like, would you create another middleware function or would you just like use the same one and make it more dynamic? Uh, so in this case, all this middleware is doing is checking to see if the user is who they say they are. So I could require this restrict middleware and put it anywhere. Because the idea is that this calls next in the success case. So it does not care what comes after it. It's just gating whether or not that happens. Um, so if I wanted to use this elsewhere, I just have to require it and stick it on here. Anything that I wanted to restrict behind a registered user. I guess what I was thinking is, you know, um, in the case we're trying to find by ID, and then you have a, the, the ID stored on the param. Um, and then some some endpoints do not have the ID on the on the param. So like, how would you use it uh, on both types of uh, endpoints? Unless you're just searching by username, is that the solution? You yeah. Think? Yeah. So the the way that this specific middleware works is we're trying to get uh, information out of the request headers that's going to allow us to verify that the user is logged in. Now, normally we would do this uh, either by getting a cookie out of, out of the request object or by getting a JSON web token out of the request headers or out of a cookie in the request object. Um, you know, we, you all learned cookies today, but uh, I'm a day behind in these, so we haven't learned how to do those. So all we're doing is we're getting the username and the password out of the request headers, and we're verifying that information. So we're, not, we're never checking for the user ID. The user never really knows that information about themselves. Um, so that's how we're choosing to verify it. If we wanted to do a middleware that did some things with the user ID, right, to verify the user existed, 
um, you know, in 404, in the case that that resource doesn't exist, like we've written in previous middleware, then yes, we would we'd write a different piece of middleware, because this is strictly for authenticating a user. It's not necessarily checking to, to see if a resource exists in our database. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So, um, yeah, but normally, I mean, this is this is just in place since we haven't, I mean, since we haven't covered cookies or, or JWTs. Yep, and it's yeah. it's it's functionally transparent, right? The idea behind restrict is that it gets all the information it needs out of the request, and it determines whether or not it wants to pass it off to the next piece of middleware. So, like you all saw in lecture today, when using cookies, you simply instead of getting this information out of the headers, you would check the cookie information for their session. Um, and for JSON web tokens, you're gonna get the JSON web token out of the headers. And what you're gonna be doing in this if statement is checking to see if the JSON web token is valid. So this middleware is, is of the correct format to handle better systems for authorization. Um, it just, we don't have those in place right now. So we're just doing a very basic version of that. Um, so the advantage of, you know, this middleware, right, is we've abstracted it to this function that is, uh, we can change how it works however we want in this endpoint, it's gonna be none the wiser. Um, I also wanna point out that, for example, if I go into index.js and let's say I want to restrict all of the user's routes, we can just pop a middleware right here too, um, so that we can uh, just restrict all of those and, and don't have to put them on individually. If we want to do it individually on some, then we can do it on these endpoints. But uh, we can be pretty liberal about you know uh, how and where we want to apply our middleware because it's all all Express really is is just pieces of middleware stacked on top of each other. Okay. So uh, any other questions about our basic Express app here? Okay, I'm gonna attempt to hit uh, land record speeds in getting our uh, React app going uh, because I would like to show how to do that real fast. So I already created one in this client folder. I'm gonna go into source. I'm gonna get rid of the service worker and the SVG because I hate them. I'm gonna delete the service worker and any reference to it. I'm gonna go into app, delete the SVG, delete the contents of our app. Okay, and so now I'm gonna do yarn start in my terminal um, to get the React app running. Yeah, I haven't written one of these in a while. This is gonna be an adventure for all of us. So um, oop, I'm going to need to yarn add uh, react router. Is it react router or react router dom? It has been a while since I've done this. See, if any of you are watching this and are suddenly feeling uh like, uh-oh, it's been a while since I've done this. Well, then you should probably write a React app right now. You'd be surprised how much some of the little fiddly bits leave your leave your brain. Um, yeah, and we want React Router DOM. Yeah, should make an npm package for create clean React app. I'm sure there's an option for for create React app that will uh, prevent it from populating it with you know the little bit of extra noise, but it's not a big deal to uh, to delete those. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try to to get our um, our login component and our signup component written. Oh, I wanted to talk about seeds. I'll do that in a minute. Um, so I'm gonna create a folder called components. In here, I'm gonna create one called, let's do login.js first. Um, so this is gonna have us import React from React. I'm also gonna go ahead and get um, use state 
and use effect. Um, we're also going to need to import Axios from Axios in order to make requests. Um, we're going to create our login React app, which is going to take in props. We're going to export login as our default export. And then what I want to do is I want to uh, render a form. And let's get this around some, some nice parentheses. So I want to render a form. Um, we're going to have an input be the username. Uh, let's give it a placeholder too of username. And then we want one for password. Uh, username is going to go to password. And I'm also going to set it of type password. So we get those nice little dots instead of our, um, our actual plain text password as we're typing it in. Um, and then we're going to need a button of type submit. And this is going to say log in. Uh, on your build week projects, be consistent about how you spell login. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't care how you do it. Just keep it consistent. Um, so then what we're going to want to do in here is we are going to import this into our app. So go into our components folder, grab our login component. And for now, I'm just going to render this without doing any stuff. There we go. There's our thing. And I spelled placeholder wrong. Plaque holder is a very gross name for teeth. Okay, so we've got our login going. And what we want to do is we want to have the user type into our form. And we want to on submit, send a request to our server and see if uh, they successfully logged in. If they are, we're going to take some action. If they aren't, we're also going to take some action. So this is going to require us to write our our form information. So uh, let's call this, uh, I'm going to call it creds short for credentials, set creds, and we're going to use state and make this be um, an object that I'm actually going to save up here is const uh, initial creds, because I'm going to use this on reset as well. What we're going to do is have username be an empty string, password also be an empty string, and we're going to use that as the initial value of our creds state variable. So then now in here, I'm going to set the, uh, the value of this to be our initial creds dot username. And uh, for our password one, same deal, but with the password. Oh, I don't want it to be initial creds. This should just be our creds. This should be our stateful variable. All right. So then now I'm going to need to write our on change function, which at this point, just a one liner, it's going to take in the event and we're going to set creds to be the spread version of creds, but we're going to use e.target.name to select our key name, and we're going to set that equal to our event.target.value. So I can add these as the uh, on change handler. Um, and I'm going to rename this function to handle change because that's how I prefer to name it. There we go. All right. So let's see if that was successful. Yay, I can type in my form. <laughs> Woohoo! I always think it's funny when it's like, oh, I can type in the thing that was designed for me to type in it. Um, all right, great, great. So then I want to handle the submission. So I'm going to write my handle submit function, which is going to take in the event. And we're going to have to call event.preventDefault because I do not want this page to refresh. Uh, which is the default behavior on submission. And I don't, also don't want to add the username and password to the URL. That matters a lot here. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to send an Axios.post request to my localhost server at port 8000 slash auth slash login. And I want to send my creds along as the request body. Then in the case that it's successful, um, I'm just going to console log um, 
whatever was given back to me. Um, so this is the response object. So we'll just console log the response object. Um, but in the case of the catch, let's get our error. And um, I'm going to console log the error dot response. So let's try logging in. Let's also get our developer console up. Okay, so let's check. Oop, type in the wrong place. Henry and test. So we log in. And oh, I did the thing. I did the thing that I always do. Jeez, you think at some point I would learn to add my submit handler here. And I also spelled it wrong up here. Wow. All right. So we have our handle submit appropriately connected to our form. This is exactly what I don't want to happen in the URL here. Um, so then we are going to check Henry and test. We're going to log in and uh-oh, uh-oh, I received a cores error. So we haven't talked about cores. We'll talk about cores uh, more tomorrow when we do cookies. But the idea is by default, when we make requests to servers via JavaScripts, our browsers prevent us from making requests to any address that is not the website that we're currently on. And we can enable this by sending back certain headers on the server with the response that say, you know what, they're allowed, they're allowed to make cross-origin requests. But we have to enable that explicitly. And the fact that we're on localhost 3000 compared to localhost 8000 matters. Anything before our first slash is our host name. And when those don't match, browser don't like it, we have to explicitly enable it on our server. So the way we do this is a lot simpler than you might imagine. I'm going to kill the server. I'm going to do yarn add um, course, which is a nice npm package someone made in order for us to do course things. I'm going to start our server back up. I'm going to pop into our index.js. And then I'm going to require cores. And then I'm going to do server.useCores. And again, it's a function. We have to call it. You can pass configuration options in here, which we'll see tomorrow. Um, but you don't need it by default. It's just going to allow any website to make cross-origin requests against this server, which is not really the behavior we want in production. But while we're writing these apps like this, yeah, totally fine. And also, if we were writing an open API, yes, we would want anyone to make course requests. So I'm going to try setting this again. Yay, our course request isn't blocked. And so now we get status 200, and we are logged in. Let's check and see if we can break it. Oop, 401, not logged in. So this is where we can do our manual error handling. Uh, if we were writing a formic form, you know, we could do our own type of error handling there. But what I can also do is I can just set up another stateful variable and call it um, uh, error, I guess. Use state. Uh, and initially, I'm going to have it be null. And what I'm going to do is inside of my form, I'm going to say, if the error is defined, then what I want to do is I want to make a div and have it display our error. And inside this catch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the error to be our error.response, which is going to give us that response object, right? And then dot data, which is going to give us the response data that our server sent, and then dot message. Because if we look inside of our auth router, I decided to send a message here that, that says something. And we can leverage these messages in order to give good feedback to our user. So I'm going to set the error to be that message. And then when the user logs in and that fails, they'll be able to know why. Because the server is telling them. Invalid password. Look at that. Neato. Uh, and so um, I think I'm going to call it here. Um, we could 
uh, you know, go and, and write the rest of this React app. But I feel like this is probably enough to perhaps uh, prompt some of you to go out and write your own because it's a lot of stuff to remember in here. Right? And and some of it, like, oh, you, you saw me forget for a second the correct, correct dependencies for um, React Router just because I haven't touched that in a few weeks. So I want to stay fresh on this. I want to stay sharp. The I'm going to check. Do we have any questions on, on this part, cores, or the um, the React form? Yeah, Henry. Um, for the error.response, um, I'm trying to, like, translate to how does it work with error.message. You have error.message on node, and then with the uh, React, it's error.response.data.message. How did you, like, know that? So it's it's because error dot message is a default part of the error object in JavaScript. If you go to the MDN page, the error has a, a literal um, property called message. Um, and so when we receive the errors being thrown by Next and SQLite, um, part of what that contains is the error message. But uh, I'm not interested in that here. What I actually want is the response object. And not all errors are the default errors that JavaScript throws. We can write errors that build on top of those. So the error that Axios gives us has a property called response, which gives us the response object that um, the server sent back to us. And um, in any response objects, we can do dot data to get any data the server sent back with the response, right? That's going to give us essentially the response body. And inside that response body, I decided to send back an object that contains the key called message and has the value invalid password. I could change this. I could call this error message, and then I would have to change this to be error message. This last thing here is just inside the body of our response. There's nothing standard about it. Um, I just chose that to be message. It's best if that's consistent so that your front end can write consistent code like this. Um, and, uh, so that, that's how that works. Um, the, the error value that Axios gives us back has a special property called response, and then everything response onwards is just our standard dealing with responses from a server the way we would with Axios. Uh, any other questions with this part? Um, yeah, this this might be a little outside the scope, but I'm wondering for build weeks, um, if you're dealing with iOS or data science people, how would you configure your cores for them? It's, it's not going to matter. Um, cores, cores has to do with um, uh, really the browser uh, and its settings. And all you have to do is, is uh, we'll talk about this more tomorrow. I think I have the MDN pull, page pulled up for it. Um, there's a header that the server has to set um, called access allowed, I believe. Yes, access control allow origin, and it specifies the, the origin URL of um, the browser making the request. On a native app, on phones, I don't believe they will have an, an origin here. Um, and when we make requests with Insomnia, we don't have an origin. Right? That's why we don't have to set cores to get this to work. This isn't a browser. Um, so it's a security feature on the browser side. And if we want to make it play nice, we can set origin either to be exactly the origin that that is making the request that we want to allow or we can set it to be a star and that will allow any origin so that's that's the core's basics so um your, your core shedding should work fine um yeah thanks you're welcome um okay uh Oh, I want to cover seeds real fast. Do we have any other questions on uh, on this stuff? We're going to make a seed, call it users. Uh, I'm going to pop in there. And I just want to show this because it's, it's something that I see people goof up a lot during build week. 
um, or they'll seed in some users data, right? We wanna delete the users table. Actually, we want to truncate it. Um, and then we're gonna insert into the users table. We don't need IDs here. Um, username of uh, bard and password of dog, right? That should be good. Seeding my users ready, ready to go, uh, you know, test that. You're never going to be able to log in as Bard. Can anyone tell me why? It's because whenever we check a user against the password, we hash, we hash the passwords in order to check them. This password isn't hashed. We're storing the plain text password inside of our database. That's not what we want. That's bad. So what we do here is users.js, just a JavaScript file. I can import bcrypt in here. So if I want to put this user into my database, I can call bcrypt.hash sync. Hash this password as many times as I feel like. Now we have a good seed user ready to go. So make sure to hash the passwords. All right. Um, any final questions here? All right, cool. Well, then I will see you all tomorrow with a discussion about cookies and some additional stuff about cores. So thank you all so much.